other side of midnight presents what you're about to hear is not a news broadcast perhaps you can help solve the mystery this is the Murano mystery 33 minutes after the hour ships occasionally do interesting things ships collide with icebergs and sink Ships get into battles and are destroyed. What they don't generally do is disappear. How could the biggest ship in the U.S. Navy vanish without a trace? That's the question that was on many people's, many people's minds in March of 1918, when an enormous vessel, the USS Cyclops, disappeared on a voyage between the West Indies to Baltimore. A century later, more than a century later, it's still no closer to being answered. This was a ship that was nearly 550 feet long, 11,000 tons. She had been sailing successfully since 1910 between the Baltic Sea and... And the Caribbean and Mexico and assisting with moving coal around the world and helping refugees. But in 1917, when America entered World War I, Cyclops became a key naval asset transporting troops and coal to fuel other ships all over the world. A crew of 306 people vanished. What became of them? One of those people that, val- that vanished was the great uncle of our next guest. And uh, he, our guest, has been the author of multiple books on the USS Cyclops, multiple books in general, including USS Cyclops Volume 1 and Volume 2. I'm very happy to uh, welcome to the program for the first time, Marvin Barish. Marvin, thanks for joining me. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, sir. Thanks for having me. So, Marvin, uh, tell us who your great uncle was. My great uncle was a young man that uh, worked in his uh, family's tailor shop in Baltimore. Uh, there was a large family, but a uh, few of them still remained uh, to, to work in the shop. Some others had uh, gotten married and moved on. Uh, my great uncle Lawrence was still single. At the time he enlisted in the U.S. Navy, he was 22. He was one of the first 800 from Maryland to enlist in the Navy following the uh, call from uh, President Wilson and uh, was so uh, uh, commemorated in a massive plaque that's uh, in the uh, Maryland State House. Uh, it honors the uh, first 800 from Maryland to enlist. If I may correct you on one item, it was actually 309 individuals that perished. Ah, thank you. Okay, forgive me. 309. Okay. Got it. Not 306. Yeah. No, that's all right. So it was nearly 106 years ago, and uh, so the uh, so as far as my uncle, uh, he uh, he enlisted. He uh, signed up in Baltimore. He uh, began as an apprentice seaman, uh, earned uh, all of uh, seventeen dollars and sixty cents when he first enlisted. He was assigned to the Cyclops. Uh, started off as a fireman third class, eventually got promoted to fireman second class. He was one of the individuals that worked deep in the bowels of the ship, shoveling coal, working with the boilers. Uh, it was just uh, not a uh, pleasant uh, duty, I'm, I'm certain. But uh, he was all of five feet, four and a half inches tall, 135 pounds. So he was a little guy compared to... Uh, uh, I guess many people nowadays, but um, he he still he still pulled his load, kept his nose clean, and uh, performed well in every uh, everything I found. And to this day, my understanding, and correct me if I'm incorrect on this one, is that there's been no wreckage found of the Cyclops. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Yes, sir. Okay. So, what were the prevailing theories? surrounding the disappearance of the Cyclops and have any gained more credibility over time? I don't think that any really good theories have have held water, if you will, 
for all these years. Uh, the, the biggest difference between the the years that the Cyclops successfully traveled, uh, at least on the, the one hemisphere, uh, carrying coal and uh, liquid fuel oil, was that's what the ship was designed to carry, uh, coal and uh, liquid fuel. The difference on the final cruise back from Brazil and then the uh, the brief layover in Barbados and the, the final leg during which she disappeared was her cargo was manganese ore, which is a, a different game altogether. It's a lot denser material, needs to be handled differently, loaded differently. It's not a dangerous material necessarily. It's just uh, a lot different, uh, has different requirements for handling and, and, and um, stowage on, on a ship. And as far as you can tell, and I know you've looked into this thoroughly, how did the circumstances surrounding the disappearance of the USS Cyclops differ from other naval disappearances of that era? Well, we were still at war. The First World War was on. Uh, there were rumors that perhaps there was a, a German U-boat that uh, had attacked her. There was no proof. Uh, the Germans disavowed that pro, uh, post-war. Uh, the circumstances in, in this case was Cyclops was traveling alone. Uh, she was out of radio contact um, during the period where they, they tried to, uh, uh, I guess, make a routine call to, uh, to see where she was. She basically dropped off the face of the earth uh, following her uh, departure from uh, Barbados on March 4th, 1918. And uh, there were there were people that saw her off. But uh, after that, uh, there was no contact, no sighting, uh, nothing. Could, and if people are just tuning in, we're talking with Marvin Barish. His book is uh, USS Cyclops, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Could environmental factors, like uh, some sort of weird weather or geological events, could that have played a role in the disappearance of the vessel? It's quite possible. The The ship had a uh, history of severe rolling on uh, one day in particular, August 22nd, 1916, during some heavy weather off the coast of Rhode Island, uh, she rolled 50 degrees to starboard and 46 degrees to port. That's not really a, a good situation. She basically was a, a flat bottom craft. And I guess if everything was loaded properly, she would tend not to roll. But here she was carrying her normal cargo, not uh, an unusual cargo. So she was designed to carry uh, this particular cargo on that on that day that uh, she had heavy rolling. Um, the other thing was, um, over time, she, uh, I believe, had some structural weaknesses. There were some, some fires that took place on the ship. Uh, back in 1915, there were two fires that lasted a week, a uh, couple months apart. One was in the bunker coal, the coal that the ship would use to propel herself, and then the cargo holds where the, uh, the coal was kept to transfer to other vessels. So perhaps some of those weaknesses, there was also the possibility that a, a rogue wave could have attacked her. Um, on her final cruise back from Brazil, one of her engines was inoperative. The starboard engine uh, had a uh, piston problem that the Navy decided would not be repaired down in Brazil, that new parts would be manufactured in Philadelphia and shipped to Baltimore to affect, I'm sorry, uh, I believe it was uh, Norfolk to repair the ship. But one of the, the odd things that came out of the notes that I found was that they believed that there was perhaps a uh, design flaw in that piston and that they were going to create new parts. So uh, while they were blaming the maintenance crew, uh, the the engineer and so forth on the ship, for letting some knocking sounds persist, and then the um, crew shut down the engine, 
uh, before they uh, opened up the cylinder, uh, these guys were kind of blamed for something that might not have actually been their fault as far as any maintenance issues or, or things that they might have uh, neglected to do. Um, so there's a lot of different things on her final cruise that were unusual. And uh, uh, as far as being able to head off uh, any particular bad weather or in the case of a rogue wave, they probably wouldn't even know what's going to happen. I suspect she probably went down at night. Uh, there was nothing found on the surface uh, anywhere. And she probably slipped quietly beneath the waves. And uh, as, as a result, I believe, of uh, a rogue wave. Mm -hmm. I think she probably made it to the uh, Puerto Rico Trench area, which is the uh, the deepest spot in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, at, I guess at her deepest depth, she's about five miles. One of the things that we see regularly is that there are ships or shipwrecks going all the way back to the Spanish Armada that are discovered by different um, you know different explorers. We saw the wreckage of the Titanic discovered, uh, I guess, about 70-something years after after it went down. What advancements in technology, if any, or search methods have been employed in recent years in order to locate the wreckage of the USS Cyclops? There's a, a lot of new technology that uh, we, we have the benefit of that uh, just needs to be deployed. There are different uh, probes that can be just dropped down to the uh, the depths uh, that can transmit uh, photos and uh, 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 detect um, the presence of, um, I guess, different uh, types of metals or materials foreign to the seabed. Uh, we have uh, side scan sonar, which I'm sure can do a pretty good job. There's a lot of remote sensing that uh, wasn't available many years ago. And uh, there, there were some searches for the ship, primarily um, closer to shore off the, uh, the coast of Virginia back in the 70s. Uh, that uh, gentleman uh, thought he had found the ship. Turns out it was a much newer vessel. Uh, as far as... Um, any real looks? I think it's if my theory holds, the the depth is probably the biggest factor as far as keeping the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the secret of the uh, demise of the ship uh, intact. Uh, Titanic, if I'm correct, was about a mile and a half deep. So if Cyclops is about five miles, a little bit different type of uh, strategy would need to be employed. Let me ask you this, Marvin. Uh, obviously, you have a personal family connection to this, but for the public at large that's listening to this, so often when I do segments that involve history, uh, historical mysteries, whether it's the Lincoln assassination or what became of uh, President Zachary Taylor or anything, the, the mystery of Roanoke Island, so often, uh, basically, the response that I get from some cynical listeners is, who cares? Th th they're gone. It's over. Let's focus on things in the present day that are with us now. In your opinion, Marvin, why does the disappearance of the USS Cyclops in 1918 still matter? Why should anybody care about a ship that disappeared over 100 years ago? Well, I believe it's the same reason why people care that anybody uh, is killed on the battlefield today or at, at sea. Uh, in the case of Cyclops, I've, I've met a number of different families who are still concerned, would like to bring this matter to rest and bring peace and, uh, and, and such to all involved. Uh, it may be that uh, one day somebody in their family you know, heaven forbid, would uh, meet their demise. I think they want the same consideration as far as understanding mm -hmm. what happened and uh, perhaps prevent 
uh, similar instance from occurring. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about this. I, I my understanding is that the Cyclops actually disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. There's been a lot written over the years about what goes on in the Bermuda Triangle. Why do you think so many things tend to go missing in the Bermuda Triangle? I believe it's uh, an area that's uh, geologically a little bit different. Uh, there's a lot of, it's, from what I've observed on, on various charts and uh, have, have read as best as I can on the subject, uh, it's kind of like a mixing bowl of various currents, different temperatures. Uh, there are theories as far as um, uh, gases that might surface that might create buoyancy issues, um, perhaps some magnetic anomalies in the region. But I, I just, uh, I've, I've, I've been down there. I mean, I've, I've swam in waters off Puerto Rico, and, and I came out okay. Uh, so I don't think it hits everything that touches the triangle. Um, there was a... a kind of a, an, an odd thing that happened when the uh, the ship was launched that would would almost uh, be a forbearance. Hmm. Um, when the, they tried to launch the ship on May 7th, 1910 at Philadelphia at the shipyard on the Delaware River, there was a delay as the Collier um, got stuck on the ways and she had to be jacked up and persuaded into the water. So that might have been considered uh, kind of a bad omen. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so uh, I I don't believe in the hocus pocus. I I don't subscribe to it. I just couldn't ignore, you know, when I came across a piece like that. Uh, But um, I just think there are a lot of things about the earth that we still just don't understand. I, I think that's probably the uh, the truest thing I've heard anybody say in a while. Marvin, uh, we're going to have to end it there. I appreciate that. Hopefully we'll chat again in the future. Best of luck with your efforts. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, talking about the subject. Sure thing. Uh, Marvin Barish, great nephew of one of the sailors on the USS Cyclops and the author of USS Cyclops. Uh, you can get them wherever books are available. If you want to comment. On any portion of our discussion, you're welcome to do so. 800-848-9222, 800-848-9222. This is The Other Side of Midnight. Straight ahead.